Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Read With Me. I'm yours truly, Isabel Bedell, and I'm here to read with you some more. We are going to get into chapter four of Big Money Energy by Ryan Serhant. This cool guy right here. Love him. I love him so much. He's a great guy, great dude. Um, I love the energy that he brings, and I love you know, being able to see him go from, you know, not having that much confidence and how he overcame those things and the action steps that he took to get to where he is. And to see him now is just like really, really awesome because he's, he's someone that didn't, didn't came from, didn't come from like a lot. Okay. He had to fight through it. And I feel like many of us that are, you know, building our own business, uh, building teams, trying to figure out taxes, you know, trying to figure out what adulting is, like trying to figure out all these different things that come with being independent and having all the freedom in the world. You know, all of that makes makes you almost... um, open to receiving a lot of stuff that the world may just throw at you, you know? So building up these protection walls that allow you to decide, decipher like whether what's right, what's wrong, or like, how can I improve on this? How can I allow this not to affect me? How can I allow this to help me grow? This is what I love about these types of books because they bring all of that to the table and much more. So I'm excited for this chapter. It has two parts to it. So um, it's titled people who earn more. Okay. If you would like to earn more, make sure to hit like subscribe and share this with a friend or a family member that, you know, they deserve to earn more. And by you sharing and by you liking and by you commenting, you actually get 10 times that. So let's go for it, shall we? All right. Chapter four, part one. People who earn more. Right after I closed that seven-figure deal with June Shen, I thought I was like the shit. So I convinced my friend Matt, who works in commercial real estate, to get me a meeting with a big-time real estate developer named Gordon Murray, who owned buildings all over Manhattan and South America. Even though I had only made one big sale, I honestly believed that I could be a huge asset to him. Surely I could handle a 200-unit sellout on the Upper West Side, Gordy Boy. As I was riding the subway uptown, packed in with the rush hour crowd, I imagined that I could soon kiss the subway goodbye forever. When I arrived at Gordon's office in Times Square, I sat in an expensive looking chair, buzzing with excitement about all the great opportunities this meeting could bring. When Gordon's assistant told me he was ready for me, I took a deep breath and said to myself, you are awesome. When I entered, Gordon's office, I shook his hand and he gestured to a chair across from him. He was tapping his pen on a legal pad. So Ryan, what do you think about the plans for Hudson Yards? Think related will be able to pull it off given the current state of the real estate retail market? I felt my complexion start to shift from white to bright pink. Ah, shit. I have no idea what you're talking about. And I, I thought, I mean... It sounds really cool, and I think they'll do great, I said. Gordon pushed his legal pad and pen to the side. How about HFZ's planned conversion to 344 West 72nd? And what do you think about the rezoning challenges in Hudson Square in Ghana? What are your thoughts on how lobbyist efforts will affect the resi, resi landscape in the next five to 10? I mean, Effity Fuckerstein. <laughs> got me. I'm trying not to say the F word here, but got me. Okay. I still didn't know 
what he was talking about. So I launched into a super enthusiastic, passionate speech all about my big sale to Jun Shen. I didn't stop to think about how I really didn't answer any of his questions or that being unprepared would actually now mean that I'd have nothing to really talk about, which led me to go on and on about myself. Thinking back on this meeting makes me even want to throw up. Gordon looked at his watch. Okay, I have another meeting in a second. Thanks for coming in, kid. Despite my total lack of preparation and Gordon's obvious disinterest in an arrogant kid who had just made one deal, I somehow left that meeting thinking that I nailed it. I don't know why, but as I walked back to the office, I had visions of depositing even bigger checks due to my newfound awesome connection with mega developer Gordon Murray. 50,000 checks, 75,000, 100,000, that's huge. A few days later, I connected with my friend, Matt, who had gotten me the meeting. Um, and I asked him, like, tell me what he thought about me, man. I said, I was anxious to hear about what Gordon thought. But then there was an awkward silence before Matt spoke. He said, sorry, man. He said, you seem like a nice kid, but you have a long way to go. I was like, what? Is it possible it didn't go as well as I thought it did? I had walked into Gordon Murray's office thinking that I was the best real estate broker in the universe. And to hear that I didn't come off well was soul crushing and a long way to go. Oh my God, I couldn't even imagine spending the next five, 10 years renting and selling cheap apartments. How could I land those bigger projects and make millions if I came off as amateurish? The meeting only lasted 15 minutes or so, and in that short amount of time, he assessed that I had no idea what I was doing. I felt like such a jerk. In the brutal lens that retrospect provides, I can see that I was all swagger, no substance, and those qualities were not going to get me access to higher paying jobs. I walked into Gordon Murray's office unprepared and made the conversation all about me. That is disrespectful and basically screams that I'm not ready to graduate to bigger gigs. I was oozing BS money energy. Out of every single poor and there is nothing that makes a person less likable, why was someone with BME, big money energy, like Gordon, Gordon Murray, want to actually work with me with a snotty little F like me? Fast forward a decade, and he wrote it in his little notes here. Fast forward a decade now. I now know that Gordon was actually being incredibly generous with his assessment of me. And then here, here he goes with a very important uh, lesson here, okay? BS money energy. Don't step in it. We've all encountered someone with BS money energy. They are ego-driven, self-centered, name droppers who do things like bark out ridiculous demands and think that acting like a dick makes them powerful. That is the polar opposite of what BME actually is. If you are not a certified genius on the level of Steve Jobs, who has reinvented the entire world, and so it doesn't matter whether or not you're enjoying, you are enjoyable to be around then you can't horribly and still experience great success. If you want to make a lot of money, people actually have to like working with you. It was tw- I was 26 years old when I was a cast on Million Dollar Listing New York, and I had not yet learned the lesson that being authentic, kind, and likable is an important component to success. I wasn't a, barbar- a barbarian by any chance. My parents raised us to have manners and be polite. But I was on a TV show watched by millions of people who were acting crazy, loud, and outrageous. And frankly, some of my behavior was downright disrespectful, brought more attention. I will never, ever forget the first time that I was recognized by someone for being on TV. I was rushing on the subway one morning when I heard a woman say, hey, are you the guy in the show? I was in a hurry, but I stopped because for an entire year of being on Million Dollar Listing, no one had ever said anything. So I couldn't believe it. When I turned to say, yes, it's me, the woman looked at me like I had kidnapped her little sister and burned down her grandmother's home. Disgust 
radiated from her eyes like laser beams. And then she shouted, you're such a jerk. At the time, that stung a lot. But now I understand why she said it. I might not have been a total jerk in real life. I swear I wasn't. Like, asked my friends or even asked my mom. But the qualities I projected er in the early seasons of the show didn't exactly make me seem like the kind of guy you'd want to invite to your birthday party. If you want to really hear the honest truth about your about what you're like as a person, try going on TV to be judged by millions of people around the globe. And those millions of people made it very, very clear that I was full of BS money energy. Being on a reality TV, being on reality TV is like living your life under a powerful microscope. I am not complaining, okay? Being on Million Dollar Listing has been a great, great asset for my career. And it's actually really fun. But imagine what it would be like if for an entire year of your life, it was edited down towards your most dramatic and sometimes ugliest moments and then broadcast it to the world. Like, you know, that one time that you flipped out because you burned your grilled cheese or when you lost your temper and cussed out like a sailor on the street because you spilled coffee all over yourself on the way to an important meeting. Or that one time that you were actually on a date and got a little drunk You know, if that was shown as the story of your life, you might end up looking bananas. I agreed to have my life filmed and potentially look bananas on TV. So I was definitely opening myself up to being called a jerk by a total stranger. But after the encounter, I started getting noticed in public more often. And then before I knew it, it felt like every other person on the street knew who I was. I had no idea how many people watched the show And it was pretty weird. It felt like half of the population really liked me and the other half really didn't. Random guys would shout out to me on the street, hey, Ryan, you're the man. And I was like, me? Oh, I assure you, I am not the man. But this made me think, how did people actually see me? And was this how I really wanted to be seen? It's one thing to be disliked for being on a reality TV show, but it's another thing to be disliked in real life. So was what I believed to be charming Ryan Reynolds style banter actually really making me seem like a total asshole? Well, when Million Dollar Listing New York started, I wasn't really thinking about what about being liked. I wanted to be a successful broker with big personality. I didn't understand that those two things were very closely related. How could I make a lot of money in my field if people hated me? You don't hire someone you think is a total jerk to sell your home or find you a new place to raise your children. So if I wanted to make the best real estate broker in the universe, if I wanted to become one, I needed to make millions doing that. I needed to care about how I came off to people. I needed to be more comfortable showing my real self and get rid of the overdramatized cartoon of a 20-something bachelor who acts like it's funny to forget the names of women he dated or to take off his shirt and jump into the pool of his colleague's open house. If you haven't seen the episodes of Million Dollar Listing, go on YouTube, check it out. I actually want to check all this out because I don't remember this side of him, um, but I now I'm curious. Okay, here is the BS audit. This is something that we all need to put into account. A BS audit, aside from a handful of exceptions, mainly geniuses, you will not experience massive success if you aren't self-aware. Now that I'm in a position to build a company and hire people, I can tell you I've seen some things. I've had brokers who mistakenly think that over-the-top saccharine sweetness or empty invites to their homes in the Hamptons is how you endear yourself to a client and land yourself at expensive listings. It comes off as fake, and people see right through that kind of insincerity. There was a really smart member of my team who had a lot to contribute, who had no idea that his colleagues viewed him as standoffish and unhelpful. This definitely could have prevented him from getting ahead and increasing his earning potential. I've interviewed people for positions to walk into my office with bravado, only to throw themselves in a chair and sit there slumped over and looking sad. If I'm thinking, are you going to cry? 
I'm definitely not going to hire you. There's no way you're going to earn big if you're spending all your time searching for tissues to dab away at your tears. Then there are the people who can't make eye contact. They're staring at the space of right above your left shoulder. What are you looking at? Like, is there a ghost standing behind me? There are a lot of quiet talkers, the loud talkers. I admit I was actually part of that category. There's a limp handshake, and then there's a reverse, the vice versa, like the, the death grip, which is a total red flag for big money energy, uh, you know, which is a total red flag for B, you know, the BSME, which is bull money energy, okay? when you have a really stern handshake. You need to know how you come off to others. If you want to succeed until, if you want to succeed, until I broadcast this to 25 million people, I thought I knew myself, but I was very, very wrong. But I'm going, I'm about to tell you something that is very important. So listen up closely. If you're not getting what you want from life, if you're not making as much money as you think you should, it's entirely possible because of something you are doing that you don't even know that you do. So here's code number five. Insist on brutally honest feedback. Demand it. Appreciate how the short-term pain will promote you long-term growth. And it all comes with you. Figuring out whether or not you are likable starts with being open to criticism. That's a good one. Figuring out whether you are likable starts with being open to criticism. Criticism can be your very best friend. As someone who has opened themselves up to constant criticism by being on a t- television and social media, I say bring it. If I'm doing something that is off-putting, offends or offends people, makes me sound dumb or just drives people crazy. I want to know about it. If I've been running around Manhattan all day in the July heat and come back to the office and someone tells me that I smell, my reaction is not going to be, why are you so mean? It's going to be like, oh my God, thank you so much. I I had no idea I was so pungent today. Okay. Thank you for bringing this to my attention before I actually go and meet my next listing. To be truly successful, you can respond to feedback and criticism by being defensive. Let me write that. Let me highlight that. To be truly successful, you cannot respond to feedback and criticism by being defensive. That's what people with BS money energy do. Be open to areas where you can do even better. And how will you really know what those are if you don't listen to criticism? After my field of meeting with Gordon Murray, I asked one of my very good and very honest friends to give me a quick BS audit. How did I come off to people? What did people see when I walked into a room? Scott said, Brian, your posture is terrible. It's like you don't even know that being tall is a good thing. You sit slouched over and that makes you look so bored. Really? I, I did not know that I did this, but wait. He wasn't even finished. Lucky me. And then he goes on to say that it's like you don't even know that being tall is a good thing. You sit slouched over and that makes you look bored. Really? I did not know this. But wait, he wasn't even finished. Lucky me. And if you don't always look, and why is it that you don't always look people in the eye, he said, like, you look at the ground. Why do you do that? It's so strange. I slowly sat up straight, growing about six inches in the process. Wow, he's right. I had no idea that I was a slouger who didn't make eye contact. I'd never get the opportunity to work with a big developer, like where the actual potential to earn lots of money is. If I was actually looking bored, slouched over, and couldn't even make eye contact, that picture The picture that I was presenting was not, I will sell the sh out of your building and make you lots of money. Apparently, it was that I was bored and I want to go home. And that's definitely BS. The best thing about BS, having a BS audit, is that it can show you things about yourself that can easily be corrected. Ask a few people you trust what your best and worst qualities are. You can take it 
What if you eat like an animal? What if you're a loud chewer? Wouldn't you want to know about this before your next business lunch? You don't want to be that girl who chews loud. These are small changes that can make massive differences and greatly improve how you come off to people. The feedback you get from a BS audit are director directions for how to transform the raw material that is you into a better, more successful, richer version of yourself. I love feedback and criticism, especially at work. I think of it as my customers really telling me how I can make more money. Yes, tell me what I can do better. People with BME pay attention to all the feedback we get, and it goes into one of two categories. First, there are valid points. These are the comments that cause us to sit up and pay attention because we want to preserve our bottom line. When customers bring up valid points, we seriously consider if we need to change or alter our practices. For example, do you forget to do things your clients ask you to do? Do you come to meetings unprepared? Do you exaggerate? Do you bring negative energy into the office because it makes you feel good to bring others down? Those traits are seriously problematic and no one will want to hire you. You'll end up with the scraps of low paying jobs. And then there are get a life points. There are comments you have to be prepared to brush off. They range from, I think all the next, all the text of your website should be orange to you should be doing business in Panama if you want to be a real success or your feet are weird, fix them. These are outlier comments. They are incredibly subjective and either you don't have a direct impact on, on your bottom line or something we cannot change. My feet are my feet. What can I do? Get a life, foot hater. That's interesting. Ignore all noise that's not beneficial to you. This is code number six. Ignore all noise that's not beneficial to you. It's not raining if you don't get wet. I like that. Seen, heard, and remembered. If there was a magical charisma pill, I'd take it daily. Some people are born with charisma and others like me are not. When I think of charisma, I think of people like Tom Hanks, LeBron James, and the Dalai Lama. Charisma ultimately means that you are the next level likable. People who are charismatic have such pull that they can inspire devotion in others. Charismatic people have influence. Don't you think it would be helpful if you earn more coins in your clients? Don't you think it would help you to earn more coins if your clients liked you so much they were devoted to you? Charismatic people are able to get their ideas heard and executed, get the, pe get the right people to call them back and influence their staff to work hard and do their absolute best work. With this kind of influence, you'd be enjoying success left and right and earning a bundle. And fortunately, in the, uh, in the adult world, being popular and likable doesn't really have anything to do with being captain of the football team or head cheerleader. We can all tackle the likability basics. Smile more. Listen carefully to people. Seriously, don't look at your phone. Be curious about life and other people and exude positivity. No one wants to talk to the person whose conversational repertoire ranges from sick cats to ex crazy ex-girlfriends. The likability basics help you don't have physical magnetic pull of Brad Pitt or Charlie Theron. And that includes most humans. But there is a simple, easily, easy secret to being instant, instantly more likable and getting what you want. At the end of the day, people want to be seen, heard, and remembered. So remember that. Write it down. Tattoo it to yourself if you want to. Starting a conversation with a stranger isn't easy. And I know this will never, ever be my greatest skill, but seen plus heard plus remembered formula really helps and it makes me it makes people feel really really good so if I see someone standing alone at a party I'll walk up to him or her and say something like this hi I'm Brian cool purse now they're being seen do you live here in New York City yeah close enough we hook on we hagen oh cool New Jersey is really nice what do you like about it 
then this is the part where they're being heard. I love having the I love having the space. I actually keep three beehives in my backyard and that's okay. And yours, wowzers, you're a beekeeper and now they're being memorable. Wow, this will help you remember. Remember them and who knows, this may be a well-connected person who you'll benefit from knowing for years. Until that charisma pill exists, I will use the seen plus heard remember formula to make positive connections with people. Get those three parts of the formula down in any conversation and you're golden. Anyone who read my first book knows that I am obsessed with follow-up. If follow-up were an Olympic sport, I would be standing on top of a podium with a gold medal around my neck every single time. Try to beat me. The seen, heard, and remembered formula makes it so easy and fun to follow up with people. And people turn into clients, clients turn into money. The next time I email that person from Jersey, I'm definitely going to ask her, her how her bees are and use it in a conversation starter. Does the queen have a name? Do you have one of those badass beekeeping outfits? Does it scare your neighbors? Remember, I don't personally have to have an intense personal interest in bees, but I do care about Deb, Debbie and what my connection to her might bring me. So I ask her questions. I know she will be excited to answer in part because she will be blown away that I remembered her bees. We all love to be remembered. Debbie and beekeeper of New York, New Jersey, may have three kids who need a place to live in the city. And there I am. Now, that brief conversation I had about bees is turning into profits. Or maybe Debbie and her husband will want a peed a tear. Or maybe their friends will. Being likable is a huge asset when it comes to getting clients, working with clients, and in the end, making lots and lots of money. While your bank account balance is shooting to the sky because your likability is bringing in tons of business, you should know that these same trades can save you money too. And that is chapter four, part one. And I'm so excited to dive into the next one, but the you know, seen plus heard remembered is so strong. I remember learning about this when I was in um, the business plan competition. One of my favorite teachers, Professor McConnell, older lady, she literally started the first app for Microsoft, which is a big deal, right? Um, She was like about 70 years old. She was like leading the class, right? And she like put me under her wing and like taught me all the tricks to win the business plan competition and she's like always make sure that you are looking directly at least at two people in while you're presenting and then I was like but there's three judges why would I just focus on two she's like well the other one will get FOMO and then they will ask the questions to them and because they know that they got attention they'll be able to sell your product even better and i was like oh my god that's genius mrs Mc- professor mcconnell <laughs> that was so cool she said that and then this whole scene heard uh, remembered thing like i i remember hearing that so much and i used it subconsciously in architecture i used it subconsciously and whenever i meet someone because i'm actually curious on what what they're into, you know, and if you aren't doing that right now in your business, make sure to start doing it. It's a very simple formula. If you need to put it on top of your browser, if you need to put like a, you know, a post-it note on your wall or something, like make a little something that you see every single day, you know, that's why he was like tattoo it on you. It will open doors significantly. Just the other day, like I went to go get groceries and um, the guy that opened the door for me at the beginning, um, I was like, oh, wow, nice shirt. I remember that. And then he was like, oh, thank you so much. And then I just made a comment like, oh, my God, it's so hot. You know, he's like, yeah, it's, it's really hot. And then he was going into like, are you here? Do you live here? I was like, no, I'm here for a year, whatever. And then we got into this conversation where I realized that he really loves the cenotes here like in Mexico and then I was like cool which one's the best one 
and then he mentioned a couple of three and I was like, all right, cool. Thanks for the recommendation. I went to go do my, my thing. And then at the end, when I finished doing all of my grocery shopping or whatever, he was literally just waiting. Okay. And then he got all my bags and helped me with the Uber and put everything in the car or whatever. And he's like, whenever you can, or whenever you guys want to go to a synod or whatever, just let me know. Here's my card. I thought it was so freaking awesome. Like, obviously there was a little level of stocking involved, but <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, that level of care, that level of like awareness, that level of like attention to detail and that level of seeing, heard and remember happened to me. And I didn't feel like it was a negative thing. I know when somebody is like weird. Okay. I know, but this guy was actually very genuine. He was really nice and respectful and his card was actually professional. So next time that we want to go to a cenote or have like a little family getaway or whatever, we'll, I'll consider him, you know, versus the 20 other guys that you can find, you know? So anyways, I really, really encourage everyone to boost up their charisma and, you know, get that seen, heard, and remembered into their arsenal. It's really, really powerful. I'll see you in the next video where we get into how to get people who don't work for you to work for you. It's going to be juicy. Chapter number four, part two. I'll see you soon.